Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 790, with my guest today, Hanchi Steven Johnson. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show, founder of Whistlekick, where all the things that we're working on are in support of traditional martial artists, probably people just like you. We have a mission statement to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists worldwide, all with the goal of getting everybody in the world to train for at least six months. It's a big goal. We're working on it. We appreciate everyone who is helping us to that end. And if you want to help us to that end, well, one of the things you might want to do is head on over to whistlekick.com, see all the things that we're doing. There's a lot of stuff that we're doing. And one of the things that we do is we have a store. We sell some stuff because we've got bills we've got to pay as we work on our mission. And if you use the code PODCAST15, that's going to save you 15% on all the stuff over there. Like Maybe a hoodie like the one that I'm wearing, or perhaps some sparring gear, or one of our events. There's a lot of stuff that you can pick up, grab over there. Uh, I misspoke a little bit. Most of our events are not discountable, but we do have events. We have a lot of things over there that you'll want to check out. We also have a separate website for the show. WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com is the place to go, where you can check out every single episode we've ever done. We have transcripts, so you can search if you're thinking, hey, what has anybody talked about this? We also have episodes categorized and tagged. So has anybody from my state or my country or my style participated? Yep. We probably have somebody that's been on the show from where you are or what you do, and you can sort and search just like that. Other ways that you might consider helping us, you could tell people about what we're doing. That's still the number one way that we grow. If you like this episode, you like what we do, tell somebody about, please help us out, help us grow so we can continue to expand and provide really cool stuff for you and all the other traditional martial artists out there. You could also join our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlecake. That's our Patreon account. And if you join our Patreon, how does it work? Well, you give over a little bit of money. It starts at two bucks a month, genuinely, two dollars a month, and you help us out. And we're going to give you great stuff back. But this isn't like the PBS pledge drive that you might be used to where you know, you donate a hundred dollars and you get a crummy tote bag at two dollars a month. We tell you who's coming up on the show. It's the only pl- place you're going to find out about that. At five dollars a month, you get all that, but you also get to find uh, uh, you get a bonus episode. At ten dollars, you get bonus video, and at different tiers, you get to participate in our school owners mastermind or get drafts of books and programs. There's a ton of really cool stuff, and we know we're knocking it out of the park because people rarely stop their contributions. Now, my guest today, Hanchi Steven Johnson, we have an absolutely wonderful conversation. We talk about his journey, but we also talk about subjects like martial arts organizations. Are they inevitably troublesome? And a bunch of other things kind of along those lines. I had a lot of fun talking to him, and I think you're going to have a lot of fun listening, whether you're a student or an instructor, whether you have been through it the way he has you know maybe you've been training for decades or maybe you're brand new i think either way you're going to pull something from this episode so stay tuned well no thank, thanks yeah thanks for being here appreciate you coming on the show well, i appreciate your persistence i think <laughs> well andrew does a does a great job getting everybody booked and and uh he he is persistent isn't he uh, in, in, a, in a good way hopefully hopefully only in a good way Oh yeah, a- absolutely. He's been uh, very, very nice, very kind. You know, I'm not. Uh, I don't like getting in the public uh, f- forum too much, and so I kind of shy away from, you know, the videos and so forth. Unless I'm in a dojo, then I'm good to go. Yeah. Well, you are exactly the kind of guest that we like then, because the folks who are not out in front, not being super public, are the ones that I find have stuff that the rest of us need to hear so much more. All right. Well, we'll we'll, we'll see. It's, uh, it's, but I appreciate the opportunity, and so thank you very much. Of course. Well, uh, let, let's if you're if you're good with it, let's just dive right in. All right. Let's go. Right. Well, I like to start almost always in probably the most obvious way, and then we spider off from there. So we'll just I'm gonna I'm gonna pitch you a softball. How'd you get started in martial arts? Oh wow, uh, that is like a Mr. Karate Kid uh, type of thing. 
when I was really young, uh, in my teens, I think I was 13, 14 years old, I, um, I had a less than stellar home life. Mm. So I ran away from home. I never went back. Mm. And uh, there was a, uh, a woman uh, who was a social worker who was supposed to check in on us, and she did. Her name was Rebecca Coggins. Um, and she was my social worker for my sister and I for many years. And when she used to come to see me, she said, well, you know, you know I got a, a husband who's a black belt in karate because she saw my Bruce Lee posters mm -hmm. in my in my room back then. I said, really? You got, you got a uh, a husband that's a black belt? And um, so she had my attention from that moment on. And mm -hmm. so every time that she would come over to the house, I'd, you know, I pull out my Bruce Tegner books that I had back then and show her the basic things that I learned. I had a pair of, uh, of nunchaku that I made out of a broomstick and some eye hooks and, you know, some string with, with flip them around and things like that. Yeah. So, and so when I ran away from home, uh, there was only one dojo in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mar martial arts wasn't too popular in that town, you know, back then. And uh, so I made it my journey to go find that dojo. Mm -hmm. and so uh, and that was about 15, 20 miles from where I uh, lived. And so uh, I found the dojo. And I went up there night after night after night, and I just sat and watched. Didn't say anything to anybody, but just watched. Mm -hmm. And I would, while I was watching over to the side, I would copy the moves of all the other martial arts students that he, uh, the, the sensei at the time was um, instructing. His name was T uh, Tola Lewis. Um, they called him Toby back then. But after many weeks and him not coming and saying anything to me, and I would just come and go, just come and go every night. And um, and nobody uh, said anything to you. Nobody said anything. Here you are, you're this this thir thirteen year old kid, uh, uh, night yep. after night practicing on the side, and nobody engages with you. Uh, well, no, nope. it's fascinating. Okay, yeah, keep going. Yeah. And and then uh, one one day the sensei uh, he uh, at, uh, right before class. He went to his office, brought out a gi, and threw it at me. He said, put it on and get in class. And uh, and I said, I don't have any money to pay for this. He said, did I ask you for any? And I said, no. And I had a little bit of attitude back then because of my home life. Mm -hmm. And um, so I became his student back in uh, November of 1973, mm -hmm. almost 50 years ago. And... Um, and it was painful, you know, because back then, um, you know, his sensei was Shogo Kuniba, who was a third generation samurai warlord of you know, Motobaha Shitori Karate Do. He moved to the um, he moved to the states back in the eighties, I think, mm -hmm. you know, officially. But he did a lot of visiting. But at that particular time in 1973, when I joined, we were with Seishinkai Karate Union. And um, so, and that was, you know, under the head of Soki Shogo Kuniba. And, and at that particular time, for, uh, he had a, uh, Kuniba had a U.S. representative who was uh, Richard P. Belargian. And he was the USA uh, representative for Station Kai from 1964 to 1974. And, uh, and then as like, most stories go with organizations and so forth. There was, there was a split, yep. and um, uh, the the hearsay is much. Uh, so I won't go into that a whole lot of that. But Belarge right, right. branched off, and uh, he formed the National Karate Jiu-Jitsu Union. And uh, and Belarge was a direct student of Shogo Kuniba uh, in Motobaha Shitoryu Karate Do, and. Um, but he was also, uh, he had a ranking in uh, Hakuryu Jiu-Jitsu. Mm. And he was also a master of Pakistani stick fighting. And um, he's he was military. You know, he retired from the uh, U.S. Air Force, you know, back in the day. And um, so uh, kind of moving forward with that, you know, after Belarjan uh, founded the NKJU for short, 
Um, he brought over with him from the Station Kai, I, it was said to be between four and 5,000 students hmm. at the time, you know, nationally. And because most people wanted to be within the state where they can travel to see Belargin and attend his clinics and seminars and training. And back then, you know, martial arts was a kind of a new and upcoming thing in the U.S. So he brought Motobo Hashito Yu uh, to the United States. Uh, back in, you know, you know, between 70 and 74, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as it goes, me being a student, uh, a non-paying student of uh, Sensei Lewis uh, at the Elizabeth City School of Karate, um, I was by default Motoba Hashi Teru. Mm -hmm. So I stayed with Sensei uh, for about 16, 17 years. Uh, but you know, in between that time, you know, um, you know I made Shodan in 1981. Okay. And uh, then, you know, I joined the Navy in 1983. And, and then I, and I joined the Navy because my sensei, um, he was he kind of raised me up uh, mm -hmm. in the dojo. So, you know, at nighttime, you know, um, you know, I told you I ran away from home, so I would mm -hmm. go live and on the streets or in the back of the church or find clothes from the Goodwill and things like that, and 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 did that for myself. But when sensei found out about that, uh, he gave me a key to the dojo when I was uh, maybe. Yeah, yellow belt orange belt swarm back back in the day and uh so i stayed in the dojo at night and mm -hmm. he and his wife provided me uh clothes and food and money he, they would just leave it out uh, on a table in the dojo and uh they didn't say anything and um his, his wife um you know told her husband and i found out later not to turn me into child protective services and everything let's just take care of me and you know so i ended up becoming my sensei's first black belt mm. i'm his highest ranking uh udancha um I'm, he promoted me before he passed away in uh to hachidan and or eight don and the title of hanchi and i became the successor to the national karate jiu-jitsu union um and before that, you know, before he, oh, Arthur Blarge, and he, you know, he passed away back in 1989, and after he passed away, or right before he passed away, he named my sensei as the uh, second director of the National Karate Jiu-Jitsu Union. So likewise, since I was my sensei's uh, first Udon job and highest ranking black belt, uh, he from uh, awarded the next successorship to me. Mm -hmm. And, um, I didn't see it coming, but um, it happened because I was uh, during my um, after I left his dojo. Uh, God, I can't remember that was back in nineteen ninety one, somewhere there. Yeah. It was yes. Um, I um, he had promoted me to Yondan back then, and then likewise. Soko Kuniba was already here in the States, and he had a dojo um, about 50 or so miles from the Elizabeth City School of Karate. And so Kuniba would still visit. We'd go to his uh, his dojo, training his dojo, and eventually at some point, after Sensei uh, promoted me to Yondan, um, Kuniba also did the same. Uh, because we were the exact same style, exact same system, you know, er everything was, you know, Kuniba way. And um, so, you know, and moving forward with all that, you know, I, uh, when I was with Sensei and I was growing up, I said, I'm starting to get a little bit of age, you know, uh, now I'm uh, it, hitting me in my teens and in my mm -hmm. 20s. And I said, Sensei, I need to do something with my life. You know, what, what do you think I should do? Uh, he says, join the Navy. I said, join the Navy? I said, what for? And he says, well, you'll learn about patriotism, commitment, loyalty, honesty, 
all those things that represent my, you know, patriotism. And, uh, and he was, he had retired from the Navy as well. And, uh, and I said, and he said, well, you all, you, you won't have to, you know, be away from a home anymore because the military will provide everything for you. You have your education, your food, your shelter, your medical benefits, you get a guaranteed paycheck and that you just do what they tell you to do. I said, well, okay, that sounds good, but what do I do in the Navy? And uh, he says, um, oh, be a corpsman. I said, what is a corpsman? I've never heard of that before. He said, well, there are medical people that take care of others. And I said, oh, okay. So I um, I went down to the recruiting station, you know, probably a couple of weeks after our conversation. And I took the military ASVAB test and I failed it. And, and it's kind of really hard to fail an ASVAB test. But my education was just all messed up back then because of the family life. And, yeah. and so I think it just kind of reflected. So I was kind of disheartened at that. And, but about six weeks after that, I got a call from the recruiter and said, look, are you still interested in joining uh, the Navy? I said, absolutely. He said, well, come on down. So went ahead, went to the recruiter. Um, they, uh, I got a guaranteed school out of boot camp, which was in San Diego, California at the time, and uh, to go to medical school or to mm. become a corpsman. So I uh, went to, uh, I was in San Diego, uh, where I went to medical school or the a basic A school for uh, corpsmen. Uh, end up passing uh, that, you know, it was like several weeks long, about two or three weeks, uh, two or three months long, and pretty intense uh, between the military and the medical training. So I graduated uh, at the top of my class and uh, then left it there and went on to uh, Portsmouth Naval Hospital here in Portsmouth, Virginia. Mm. And uh, there, you know, and while I was there, I opened up a dojo on base and I taught uh, martial arts there for several years. And I got stationed on uh, my carrier on the, on the Nimitz. And while I was on the Nimitz, I taught the, the MARDET or the Marine Corps Division uh, martial arts uh, on the carrier while we were underway. Mm -hmm. And I uh, taught SEAL team units and just continued my martial arts you know, teaching from that point on. But uh, in 1997, uh, I was stationed in Japan. Mm -hmm. So uh, the recruiter gave me a choice. I either go to Hawaii or I go to Japan. So it was a no-brainer. <laughs> I went to Japan. Of course. So uh, I went to Yokosuka. And there I was with the, uh, when I, going back a little bit when I was on a carrier later on I wanted to go to a more advanced medical school uh so I applied for the Naval Undersea Medical Institute and got into that and graduated top of my class in there and um became what they call a independent duty corpsman for submarines and that's like being a a physician's assistant or a nurse practitioner um and so I left there and went to my first submarine command. And on board the submarine, there's really no room to teach uh, martial <laughs> arts because it's just too tight. I, I've taken a tour of a submarine. Yeah, you're, you're lucky if you yeah, can yeah. stand up. I, I can. I'm a short guy. Uh, uh, <laughs> Not everyone can. Yeah, but whenever we were inshore, uh, fortunately, I was on one of those type of submarines. We were, were a research and develop, development platform. So we were in for a few weeks out for a few weeks, in for a couple months, out for a couple months. Long as we were out, was about six or eight months at one time, I think, but just depends on the mission that you're going on. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, when I was in Japan, I was fortunate enough to train with a, a lot of senseis over there that I never would have been able to train with over here that I'd read about in history books. And uh, I got my opening there uh, because of a, there was a uh, Tim Jurgens, you may see him on Facebook some uh, every now and then. He was stationed over there. He was married to a Japanese woman. Was in uh, was a martial arts instructor, a student of uh, Aikido, Karate Do, Iaido, and all those things. 
So, and he could speak uh, the language fluently. And uh, so he invited me out to all these dojos and some uh, week long training seminar that was there uh, at one time. Trying to get that out of the way. Sorry. It's all right. Uh, and uh, so he would take me out to all these different dojos and um, just say, all right, you know, here, here's Sakagami Sensei, here's Hayashi, here's, you know, so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, along with the Kobudo and the uh, Iaido training, Aikido, you know, Nakazawa Sensei, there was, a, there was just a lot of different instructors who <laughs> it's been a lot of years now since I've uh, retired from the military, but I really enjoyed it in Japan. I opened up three dojos uh, when I was there. Uh, one, uh, two of them were on base, and one of them was out in the Japanese community, which was uh, pretty unique. I think it was uh, intriguing to the Japanese people uh, that uh, there was a gaijin okay, um, teaching Japanese martial arts to them. Yeah. And but uh, they so but I ended up getting a lot of students there. But before I could do all that, um, before I could teach out in the community, the you know the the financial people there in the community center in Zushi, uh, um, they said I needed a teaching certificate from the Hongu Dojo, mm. and I said ah okay. So I I met with Kunio Tatsuno. Um, who was the successor to Kuniba after he passed away. And um, and he came to see me in Yokosuka. And um, and shortly after he went back and everything, he uh, he sent me a teaching minjo uh, that I could present to the Japanese community. And so um, that solidified everything there for me. So for, I was in Japan for seven years. I uh, enjoyed it and taught a lot over there. I learned a lot from a lot of different people. And uh, I was the first, quote, gaijin <laughs> or American okay, to uh, teach Motobaha Shitoyu in Japan. And mm. uh, I didn't know that until, you know, a little bit, <clears throat> a little bit later on. Uh, so that was pretty unique. And um, but while I was in Japan, there was a, after Soki Kuniba passed away and he had named his successor Kunio Tatsuno, Tatsuno uh, had a, a chief technical director whose name was uh, Minamide. And he would come to uh, my dojo on base, you know, uh, one or two times a month uh, to go over my kata, bunkai, um, go over other Motobaha Shitaryu related budo and um so he says uh after a couple years or so he says next week uh you know, with his broken language he's next week you go to osaka test for godan mm. uh, i said oh <clears throat> uh, i said i said was and that was it so uh, i said and next week I went to the Hombu Dojo in Osaka, and there were, it was a, actually, there was a clinic or event uh, being held, and uh, he didn't tell me that, but there were people from all over, all different countries, you know, from France, from Germany to, uh, you know, a lot of people there in Japan, uh, uh, no one from America, I don't think, just me, and um and, and so we had the event that day, and at the end, you know, they had a brown belt that was uh, uh, promoted to show it on. A couple of people to need on, signed on, and then I was promoted to go on. And um, so that uh, that was my introduction to um, the Osaka Hongu Dojo. Uh, but I, I was uh, very pleased. It was it wasn't a hard test. You know, per se, but it was thorough because um, they wanted to see, you know, self-defense and, you know, kata, but specifically bunkai the kata. Mm. And um, was that the case for everyone testing or were they expecting that of you as a higher rank? 
uh, they expect that of a higher rank. You know, for the ones who tested for Shodan, they just wanted to see some self-defense techniques, some kata, uh, you know, some basic uh, kata, and some kata at the rank that they were testing for. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that was pretty good. You know, there was a um, there was Sensei Joel Baudet uh, from France. Uh, he was there, but I'd known him for quite you know quite a few years, and you know. Um, you know, he and I worked out quite a bit while we were there uh, at the event to kind of go over all the kata beforehand. And, and, and Minamide, he was uh, watching me closely, and he, and he was the one leading the testing, but Tatsuno, you know, he signed the Minjo. Um, but, uh, you know, my time there, I got to train with, you know, like I said, all styles from Shodokan, to Chitoryu, Shitoryu, Goju, Yurichiyu, Aikido, um, and it was just a a barrage of so many different styles there mm -hmm. that it was just great. But Japan, um, it was very clean, very very um, respectful. You know, even if they didn't want to be respectful, they were respectful. <laughs> Um, but you know, there the, the young people there, they're more accepting of Americans to stay in time. But the older people, they remember the war, you know, and so forth, and they uh, still are kind of upset about that a little bit. But after they got to know you, then they kind of open up and say, Hey, you know, this guy's not so bad. <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, uh, it is like, uh, I remember when Bellarjan used to tell us stories about his time in uh, Japan. He said he was the, a, a round eye or a guy gene, and they would try to run him out of a, a class in the Japanese community because he was stationed in Okinawa and mainland Japan. And um, so I kind of expected the same thing. And most of the dojo that I went to, they were pretty hard for the first night. And they, you, I don't think they really expect you to come back again, but I kept coming back, you know, night after night, week after week, you know, when I was in port. And, um, and when I came back, they ended up sometimes asking me to teach. Hmm. And so I, I said, and with the senior sensei being there, I was like, you're asking this guy, Gene, to teach? And, um, and, uh, and it was so I did, and um, I ended up having a great relationship with a lot of people, and some where I still have contact with. And I, I retired from the military in in 2003, and I still have some good Japanese friends. Um, you know, their language uh, English is not that good, so I have a software program that helps me translate. Uh, you know, in writing as well, it's called Sistran. So when they uh, write me in kanji i just copy and paste in this program mm -hmm. translate it and then i write back to them and you know translate it back in their kanji and send it back to them so we hold conversations that way sometimes that's cool and i you know i can speak you know quite a bit of japanese uh, but i'm not fluent like i used to be because nobody where i live is japanese <laughs> i'm here in virginia and my job is all american everything's american all the dojos around here are pretty much uh, American. Um, they don't speak a lot of Japanese there either. Uh, but it was a it was a um, it was a good trip, you know, as far as living there, my life growing up. Um, you know, you know, with with Sensei Lewis, you know, he you know, he passed away. Um, said the. He passed away in 2020. And now, he, here again, here's where there's a little kink in things. With all the years I was with National Karate Jiu-Jitsu Union, well, Balarjian and uh, Soki Balarjian, they called him Soki, even though he wasn't a Soki. You know, he, that, was, that was a nickname for him because he was a head of the organization, but he wasn't the family head of a style. So his official title was really Kaicho, uh, or the president or director of NKJU. So that passed on down to my sensei and to me. But with Belargian and my sensei, uh, they never trademarked the name of National Karate Jiu-Jitsu Union. Mm -hmm. And um, 
so after I was, uh, after I became the assessor of NKJU, uh, I think that was back in 2016, um, I was in the process of trademarking everything to make sure nobody else got it. And then I submitted all my paperwork and then lo and behold, somebody I had stolen the our patch, our name, and everything. Wow. And uh and after I found out who it was, um, because he, he got it trademarked like a week before I got it trademarked. So he was all over it. He knew I think he had planned this. He was a student of uh Belarians for uh, up to the rank of Shodan. Mm -hmm. And then nobody's ever heard of this guy. And I don't like to talk about people, so I'm not going to mention names. Quite and right. uh, and uh, because what, whatever situation that they're dealing with, they just did it. So I hired an attorney uh, to see what I could do to reverse that procedure. And, um, and uh, the attorney stated that, hey, you know, you can do all this. And uh, but it's going to take about two years of litigation and about sixty thousand dollars and dealing with his attorney, you dealing with me and the uh, trademark on trademark board of appeals. And uh, he, and she said, my attorney, uh, she just recommended said, well, why don't you just change the name and do something that he didn't? Um, you know, he had to get two trademarks. Because we were a National Karate Jiu-Jitsu Union, and then later on became Na National Karate Jiu-Jitsu Union International. Mm. And the only reason they did the international part is because we had some people who wanted to join uh, that were, were international, like I think it was in Germany or Sweden or somewhere. But their government wouldn't allow them unless we were uh, trademarked at, uh, or um, had a business license to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, Sensei Lewis went ahead and made NKJUI, but this other person who trademarked everything, he had two trademarks, one for NKJU and one for NKJUI. And uh, so, and he has a website up there called the Legitimate National Karate Jiu-Jitsu Union. So um, I decided... Well, it sounds a little defensive to me. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. And you could, all the emails went back and forth and you know and my attorney sent him a letter uh, to cease and desist mm -hmm. and uh which he ignored and so i went ahead with my uh attorney's advice and, and instead of getting two trade uh, trademarks i got one and it says national karate jiu-jitsu federation usa international mm -hmm. so uh, i cover all bases with one there trademark and uh, but as a result of doing so, uh, even though uh, NKJU had a a good reputation, had some of uh, some of the best martial artists that you know I've ever trained with, um, you know even in Japan, you know, the 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 Budo training that I received in the U.S. was either equivalent to or exceeded most of what I did in Japan. Because in Japan, it's just, it's a commodity for them. It's expected of them. They, it's like going to gym class here in the U.S. And so, you know, their police forces, you know, they all had to have martial arts training of some sort. I mean, it didn't matter what the art was. Uh, you know, everywhere you turn, there is a dojo somewhere. There is a Tosukai here, and Sakagami here, and, and then there was uh, Hayashi here, Mabuni there, and, all these different dojos all around me. So, uh, but so when NKJU uh, transitioned on its own uh, and brought all those four to 5,000 students from uh, the Seishin Kai organization, it, uh, it hurt Seishin Kai at the time. And then, uh, then Kuniba Soki, I think he realized that, and he is my understanding that he wrote a letter to Belargin, you know, asking him to return to Seishin Kai, and um, but Belargin said no, and uh, but however, uh, Kuniba st uh, still was friends with Belargin. They were both friends up till the day they died, 
he promote uh Kniebel promoted the Belarjan to eighth don, seventh don, sixth don, all those other things. And in return, Soki Kuniba was uh at a lot of our NKJU events, mm -hmm. uh training seminars, and you know, um he was a subject matter expert in all things Budo. And uh, but we also had um a second hand uh the second man in NKJU uh, now uh Soki Joseph Ru uh, Ruiz and uh who was good friends with Kuni Bot, spoke the language, reads it, writes it, and so forth. It's just an awesome martial artist. And Kuniba uh, I came to uh you know love Ruiz very much because he he was they, he called him Mr. Kata. Um because Soki Ruiz uh there's not a kata in this world that I don't think he didn't know when it comes to the Japanese and Okinawa side of it, whether it be empty hand or with weapons. And he's, you know, he's in his seventies a day. He still teaches and um, uh, he's still the same way. He doesn't forget anything. Mm, that's awesome. And, uh, but I love he, working with people like that. Oh yeah. He was in his, his bunkai uh, capability was just phenomenal. You know, he, not only he taught um, when we first started, you know, like I said, with Seishin Kai, as Motobaha Shitoryu, and then Ruiz became my sensei's instructor when Kunibo was back in Japan. And so we had the Zen Shotokai under Ruiz. And so most of my kata back then was looked like Ruiz and had that Shotokan flair to it. And uh, but when Kuniba came back and, uh, and this is from Ruiz himself, he asked Ruiz to look at his kata. And uh, Kuniba looked at it and it said, hmm, okay, uh, where did you learn? He says, not Shitaru. So Kuniba made Ruiz redo all of his kata, relearn all of his kata of the Shitaru system and had him test. Uh, he had to do it during a week's time and had him test for, I think, his uh, six ton, seven line, I can't remember, but it's been so long ago. And uh, But Ruiz passed and did everything, and he continued teaching Shitoryu now, but he called it, he calls it Kotosoha Shitoryu to name it after his instructors. Uh, but he is Shitoryu, Katsuru Kimpo, and his Zen Shotokai. And um, so I have a lot of history in different mm. parts of training, but my core has always been Shitoryu. Now, since we have changed our name to Federation instead of Union, uh, we've actually done better than when we were under the name of NKJU mm. because a lot, uh, some of the students who found out the truth of who was whom they left his other person's organization and joined us mm. because we have the true lineage, the true history, the true successorship, got it all in writing from our senseis and so forth. It's documented in magazines and other books and articles, you know, and so there's no, there's no doubt who the successors are because it's written, it's in history and nobody really ever on doing this other person at all, you know, and Ruiz, uh, who was the second-hand uh, person or second man in charge uh, under Belargin, never knew this guy. Mm. And uh, but if you go to his website, you'll you'll read a lot of stuff, and people just have to make up their own decisions. Let, uh, let's kind of let's kind of unpack that that subject. It was one of the first things you br you brought up was this, and the way you you said it was was so offhand we're on the same page and I'm sure so much of the audience is too, that organizations inevitably end up with these, let's call them political issues with these splits or uh, uh, people fighting for power and leadership within organizations. And it, it's, it's a story that's told over and over within the martial arts world. So here, here's kind of a two-part question. The first one being, is that inevitable? Can that, can these organizations exist without that happening? And part two, is it worth it? That's good questions. Um, I was bound and determined to not 
get into politics when it comes to NKJF or NKJU, whatever one. No matter how you still look at it, I'm still the successor of NKJU in writing mm -hmm. and history. Uh, so whatever this other guy does, he does. And, and um, you know, to me, character, integrity, all that stuff really matters. And what you say matters. Um, I watched a lot of politics. I was, everything was great. You know, from when I started training up until I was about Yondan. After Yondan, then people come from everywhere like you know, you know you're not this you're not that you know i might th you know this is mine that's mine you know he you're, you know i'm a higher rank they're higher who cares you know um to me it's about the arts the training the character the integrity you know you're sweating it out on the dojo floor let being a leader being out there on the floor with your students let them see that hey whatever you're teaching them you're doing the same and uh, they see the work in you and they feel the work in them. Mm -hmm. The politics, it just happens and uh, is because, and it usually happens because of uh, people, people wanting to be recognized and at different ranks, uh, different titles, um, you know, they want the status, you know, to be recognized. Well, that's all fine and dandy, and I, and I guess there was a place and time for everything, especially if you're really l legitimate. You know, if you uh, if you say that you're this, then you gotta prove it. Mm -hmm. um, but I was bound and determined that if I ever had my own organization, I would not be into politics. And you know, I see things now. You know, I'm I'll be 64 in May. Um, I. You know, and I think this November, it will be 50 years that I've been in the martial arts. Um, and it's important to me that uh, my the people who are in my organization, they don't talk negative about other martial artists. Uh, that whatever rank they are, however they got it, either that person or that sensei, unless it's home, homemade, uh, felt that person should be at that rank and that title, and I'm not going to question the thought process of other senseis, you know. And I, I had a, I remember having a conversation with uh, Sensei Patrick McCarthy one day. Uh, we were on virtual, yeah. and um, this is when I first made Eight Don, and I said, "Oh my gosh!" I said, "Eight Don," I said, "I don't feel like I'm an Eight Don or a Hanshi or anything like that." And I, and Sensei McCarthy says, well, you're not. And he says, you will grow into it. And I said, ah, okay. He says, nobody is ever the rank that they test for. They grow into it. He says, he said, when you test, you test. You, you do the practical. You do what your sensei wants you to do. You feed back to your sensei everything uh, that they taught you at that point, And then you grow from there. And uh, and that's exactly what has happened, but you can't do it alone. You know, the sensei needs the their students. The sensei needs people of lower rank, equal rank, and higher rank for them to succeed and be successful. Um, because yeah. we learn all the time from our students. I remember uh, just uh, you know, last year, you know. With NKJU, we had now NKJF, we have a, a big history of Hakuryu Jiu Jitsu. And, um, and that's through uh, a, the deceased Hanshi Lin, Lemuel Stroud. Uh, he and Belarjan were good friends, and uh, Stroud, I think, uh, promoted Belarjan to Yondan in Hakuryu Jiu Jitsu. But he was an awesome, you know, sensei, best man I have ever known in my life humble polite and so forth but he and he produced some really really great jiu-jitsu students well he had uh one student uh barbara uh, at then her name was barbara tindall and now her name is barbara mccubbins because she got married uh but last year in colorado when i was at our dojo uh, uh there at marshall science academy i was doing uh, i told a kata ansan 
And then, um, so she took some moves with an ansan and bunkai it in her jujitsu way. And I looked at it and I looked at her. And I said, oh my God, I never thought about that. You know, and, um, you know, I've known Barbara, you know, for 30 plus years. Mm. And, uh, but as I was watching her jujitsu and, and uh, looking at the application as how I can apply that to other parts of other kata that I have, I, it, it, the jujitsu just bloomed. You know, mm. I felt the, the jujitsu, the judo, the aikido, the different throws and all the bunkai and everything. Uh, so your, your a sensei is always, always learning. It's just inevitable. And if you're not learning, then you're stalemate. And then it's time for you to move on uh, to something else. Um, totally so, agree. Yeah, but, but getting back to your issues or your comments about the politics and everything else, it has no place in the dojo. It has no place in an organization. Um, there should be no competition or strife unless it's just uh, it's healthy competition within the dojo. You know, that type of thing. But um, that was a hard part. I have a theory that I'd, I'd like to pose to you. This is something I've been thinking yeah. about lately. So it's a fairly new theory. It's not quite baked yet. I'd appreciate your, your input. When I look at these situations that arise from, you know, inter-school politics, inevitably, I, at least the situations that I know personally, I see some people who probably didn't meet the school's standard for character and integrity and were promoted up anyway. And I look at that and I say, hmm, did the instructor, the, you're smiling, so it sounds like we might be on the same page. Did the instructor do the school and specifically those students a disservice by overlooking the personal development elements that we so often espouse in our training? The answer to your question is yes. You know, and I and I can tell you by experience. With Sensei Lewis, as I said, he was hard on us. You know, if, if it was, you know, 20 degrees outside, it was 20 degrees in the dojo, and likewise in the summertime. And um he hit hard. He 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 was like to kind of put it uh briefly, he looked like a rocky Sylvester, you know, Stallone, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and he was tough. He was a hard hitter, you know, nothing seemed to be able to hurt him. Uh, but, you know, when he, uh, when he got married to his second wife, um, I didn't know his, his, um, his wife was a green belt under him in the dojo. And I didn't like her that much. And I kind of showed that. And I was uh, just a white belt, yellow belt, you know, eventually made green belt and so on. Um, but when it comes time for me to test for uh, my green belt, uh, since they didn't pass me, even though I did well on the test, and because of my attitude and my, uh, I, I was just angry all the time and and I wasn't helping out in the dojo. I wasn't being a positive influence in the dojo. And then um so I ended up when it come from the eventually I passed, you know, I changed my attitude and did what I need to do. But I kind of backslid, you know, after I made I tested for Sun Q, my first brown belt. And then between that and the time that I tested for Shodan, so when EQ to EQ is about, you know, between Shodan, I mean, Sun Q to Shodan was about six years. Mm. For me. That's a long and time. it stayed that uh, way because of my attitude. And, and I dropped out of high school when I was in the 12th grade. Uh, and my sensei took me aside and he said, look, you, you can do that if you want to. He said, but you're not going to test for Shodan. And I said, oh, no, I want to be Sensei's first black belt. I want to test for Shodan. He says, I'm serious, Steve. He says, um, until you finish high school, okay, you're not going to test for Shodan. He says, and I'm not going to promote you to EQ. I'm not going to promote you to Sondan. No, you know, nothing. Mm. 
And so um, and back then in Little City, North Carolina, they didn't have the GED programs. So I had to go to a high school diploma program at night at a local college. Um, so I ended up going back to that, got my high school diploma. And then six months after that, I tested for my Shodan. It was a two-part test. You know, part of it was in at Elizabeth City. And then the second part was at a Fraternal Order of Police um, a seminar in Georgia under Ruiz. Mm -hmm. So, but um, because I didn't uh, show his wife, which was now Brown Belt, you know, the respect and uh, that she deserved, at, you know, not only as a senior belt to me at the time, but also being his wife. Um, um, I reflected that not liking her in the dojo and i was young and immature and just stupid <laughs> and probably thought as as some of us have have observed and i'm using air quotes observed because sometimes it's it's real and sometimes it's not where you know maybe there's a, a relation or a friendship in the school and that person gets special treatment right and whether it happened or not you were probably hon honed in on that yeah uh, yep i was, was and and I, I wanted to be just Yep, I wanted to be the center of attention. You know, I wanted to be Sensei's first black belt. And eventually I, I called up with his wife in rank. And then I bypassed her in rank because as his wife, she kind of, uh, she started having children and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and then you know, later later on in years, you know, his, his wife ended up passing away. And, you know, and I, and I grew up and, you know, saw the, the stupidity of my youth um but she was she was a good woman and she was a good martial artist and and you know maybe if she wasn't i wouldn't have been so like a pain in the butt to her when i was <laughs> young <laughs> but um but she was always her being the mature person that she was you know she paid it no attention and she just let sensei address it yeah uh but you know uh, and so if you don't hold your students accountable when it comes to integrity, the character, and the way they contribute to the dojo, you, you just can't advance them. It's just not right uh, because that does set a bad example for other students coming up. Um, I remember um, I was at a, a friend of mine's dojo and a parent walked in with her son and she had taken him from another dojo and I wanted to, uh, to join this particular dojo. And we asked, uh, and he brought a rank certificate that he had from the other dojo to show the, uh, the instructor. And, um, and we asked him, well, why do you want to join here? They said, well, because the attitude in that other school is that all they ever want to do is fight and beat up on my son and um they didn't he wasn't learning anything and he wasn't feeling good about himself and you know he just wasn't uh nothing was good for him so we need something that's more that will build up his confidence build up his attitude his character and make him be, help him become a leader mm -hmm. so he ended up joining our dojo and and now he's uh one of the senior ranking uh senseis yeah uh, so it's just a matter of you you got to learn by trial and error. There's, there's a there's nothing that can really replace experience. Yeah. And uh, so you grow up and you, you do and learn what's right, what works, what doesn't, and then what you always have to do is respect those who come before you. You know, and uh, a lot of good people in my uh, in my life. And um, if it hadn't have been for that social worker who paid attention to me, her husband being a black belt owning his dojo in this little small town in Elizabeth City at the time, and then him being associated with Cuba and Art and Ruiz and all the other martial artists, mm -hmm. and um, and his, you know, my sensei's uh, first sensei, or you know, Barry McCarty. You, probably see him on Facebook, but he's a well-known pastor now. He he run, ran a program back then with Sensei Lewis called Karate for Christ. And um, so 
And the things that we all have in common, NKJU was born on the back of the military. You know, Belarjan was a retired military, a sensei retired military, I retired military, and I was submarines. And I didn't find out till later in years that my sensei was submarines. Yeah. You know, so, and the, the other thing that we had in common that we all had the same style, core style of Shitoryu. We all had the Japanese training, and Okinawan training, and weapons and so forth. Uh, but, you know, I've had a lot of good people to help me get to where I am. I couldn't do it by myself. And the same, same still holds true now in my current position. If my organization is going to grow, I need the help of leadership to do that. You know, I'm just one person. I'm not a Belarjan. I'm not a Kuniba. I'm Steve Johnson. I'm the successor of NKJU. I'm the founder of the National Karate Jiu-Jitsu Federation, USA International. We now have schools in you know, Virginia, North Carolina, uh, Florida, Colorado, you know, Maine, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and we're continuing to grow each year. But I'm very cautious about who I allow into the organization. And, um, and I always do an interview prior to you know, have them mm -hmm. fill out an application. I look at it. I do a background check. Um, uh, see, you know, I have a, a a high don board that helps me with this process. And because the high don board, they have many years of experience. You know, uh, either with my organization or outside my organization. I have a couple of people who that are on my board that are not associated with National Karate Jiu Jitsu Federation, uh, but they're good friends that I trust. And um, they have a lot of, con all my people that are on my high on board have a lot of connections. So in martial arts, it's, it's a small world uh, when you really look at it. And, you know, especially if you're, so uh, if you're looking on Facebook, you, you see everybody kind of get to know people through social media now. Uh, so if, when somebody comes into the organization, I, I send that application and the information that I have to my high dive board. I let them review it, see if they know this person, the reputation, the character, you know, what they stand for, and so forth. And if everything's positive, uh, a decision is made collectively between the high dive board and myself to allow that person to come into the organization. Then we take him under. Now, the NKJF, like it started under NKJU, we are a traditional martial arts organization of Okinawa, Japan, Korea, China. We have martial artists from all backgrounds who uh, just want to join to an organization for the not only for the camaraderie, but for the expertise and, and training mm -hmm. uh, and the cross training. For like many of the masters of Japan, they just didn't do one art. You know, when, <gasps> when they didn't. <laughs> Well, you, you, when people think of the word kara, karate, a kara being empty and taming a hand, they think, well, I got blocked and I got kicking and I'm punching. What well, empty hand that means anything that you can do with your hands, whether it be judo, karate, jujitsu, aikido, all that stuff. Tay the hand, just do it. It's all good. Yeah. And, uh, and for people that are studying karate, they really need to have a grappling side of it. And the people that are grappling need to have a karate side of it um, because they complement one another. And as you've always heard, uh, uh, fights always go to the ground. And if you go to the ground and you don't know how to get out of that, you're doing your judo, aikido, whatever it may be, okay, then you're you're stuck. Uh, so with NKJF, we offer the ability to cross train throughout all organizations. And, and a lot of times, other instructors, whether they're my rank or lower or higher, they just want to get with an organization where they can share their arts with others to keep their art alive. Yeah. And and so I am good for that as well. And because I've had a couple eighth and ninth degree black belts uh, asked to come to the organization. And after I learned about them, I, I asked them why. Okay, I said, I'm an eighth on. I have nothing to offer you as far as your advancement and so forth. And uh, I said, and I'm not going to test somebody that's outside my rank or my style. And that's another reason why NKJF exists 
is if we have somebody that's in Taekwondo and they want to advance in uh, the Korean arts, I have a Korean representative who is a eighth or ninth don in uh, Korean arts. Mm-hmm. I have somebody. You know, I don't have anybody on the Chinese side yet, but I'm still searching. Yeah. And, but I have all the people that are in karate do, judo, aikido, you know, those type of things. The, the, the word that's coming to mind as you're talking about this versus some of the other organizations that I'm familiar with, and certainly not all, and I don't want people to out there listening to to think that I'm I'm pointing fingers or shipping hate around. But it sounds like it's about support. Support yes. for growth. It's not you know, uh, I think there are a lot of, org- I, sh- I won't say a lot, there are at least some organizations out there that exist for purposes of ego and revenue. Mm-hmm. And I- I've bumped into some of those organizations. I have no desire yeah. to be part of those organizations. And I think that it makes an organization like yours, makes it make your job a little bit harder because when people have a poor experience with that, but um I, I think any group of martial artists, whether we're grouping for competition or we're grouping for a class or we're grouping for, you know, a, a camp, a retreat, or as an organization, if if the the first purpose is not let's help each other get better in our training, there's probably something off. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's exactly right. <clears throat> I remember uh, when I tested for my Godon, and I received the Minjo. And the cost of that Minjo was $500. What, what, what is a Minjo? Oh, uh, that's a uh, rank certificate. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, I... Yeah, so it's a rank certificate, and I, it, it costs $500 for the testing and the receiving of the certificate. And I said, my $500, I was in the military at the time. That was a lot of money. And yeah. people don't join the military to get rich. <laughs> and and uh, I said, if I ever own a dojo, I said, I am never going to charge those kind of prices for a certificate of any type. Mm-hmm. And so, and I have lived up to that, you know, so anyone testing for a black belt, any rank in black belt under my organization, I charge zero dollars. Okay. Now, uh, for those testing under black belt, you know, I charge thirty five dollars per uh, per certificate per student. Mm-hmm. Um, and. And that's how I have the some support to, you know, to buy the paper, to print, you know, uh, ink and things like that, to pay for the, the overhead. Because I promised my wife uh, a long time ago that I would never use our personal money to pay for my martial arts support uh, for our organization. And, uh, and I've lived up to that. Uh, so, um, so here again, uh, when it comes to the financial part, you know, I don't need the money. I'm a director of environmental health and safety for a company that I've been with for many years, and uh, I make a good salary. So I don't need uh, money to support the organization, per se, other than for the basic things. But I expect the instructors that are under, uh, under our organization to enroll their students and uh they can issue their own dojo certificates that they want to. And if they want a certificate from here, okay, then we will issue them one. Um, I, I sign it and I'll leave a name, a space on there for the sensei to sign it. And uh, so they get an official looking um, minjo or certificate. And, um, but they have to, in order to, to receive that certificate, they have to be a member of the organization. Sure. Um, but we are very affordable we're not greedy we get together we train we have a good time we sweat we hold a lot of uh seminars and um and you know me you know one day i'm going to need to name a successor Mm -hmm. i'm looking for that person because maybe by the time i'm 70 i don't know um yeah but i'm in i'm in good health and um you know, my sensei, you know, he was not of good health when he passed away, and um, and that contributed to his passing. And I am bound and determined not to uh, let myself get slack in those areas unless something unforeseen should happen. Sure. sure. Yeah. That's, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of wisdom in the various things that you, you shared about organizationally and and how you approach things. And my hope is that some of the folks listening, whether or not you're part of organizations, there there are are lessons you can pull into the way that you run your school. You know, you you articulated it. I feel 
I don't want to say strongly, but I, I think that our the the expectations we have of folks should reflect our expectation. How do I want to say? It? I'm going to say it a different way. If you charge a lot of money for black belt testing, you are discouraging people from testing for higher rank black belt. That's right. I, I'm a fan. Okay, so that five hundred dollars that represents <clears throat> how many months of training? Well, cut it up and put it in the put it in there. Yeah. Right. If it's yes. just, if it's an extra five bucks a month, then raise raise your prices five bucks a month. Let the the your expectations of people reflect the the goals that you want them to have. If you want them to progress up, don't don't set a financial barrier. Which let's face it, most of us perceive that the way you talked about it while you were serving, it comes across as a penalty. You you mm -hmm. want me to pay all this money to test for my my fifth don? Mm -hmm. Oof, that hurts. It's discouraging. You probably know, I've certainly met people who have been held back because they don't have the money. Yes, maybe right. They could have talked to their instructor or something, but just that that barrier being placed in front of them. I've, I've never been fond of that. And, and I encourage schools to operate however they, they choose to operate and whatever works for them because there's no one size fits all model. But I think it bears pointing out that, you know, if you, if you want people to stick around and grow, you got to build a culture including the, the financial piece that encourages mm -hmm. that. And it sounds like you're doing that not only in your school, but in your organization. Yeah, well, you know, it goes back to uh, in Sensei's dojo um, throughout all the years, he never charged me for a class, a certificate, tournaments, rank testing, yeah. you know, seminars. He never charged me one dime. And so not... I have to I have to pay it forward. You know, same same thing. If we have anybody out there that wants to become a member of this organization, uh, if they tell me that they can't afford it, then they're still welcome. It doesn't cost them a dime, and uh, I will hook them up with a sensei that is near them, or assign them uh, to a sensei to help them grow, and and that's just the way it has to be. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, and I don't, I don't know that. You know, I, I want to go back to a, a little something that, from the time all the years that I was in Japan, those seven years, and I wasn't back in the USA. Um, when sent uh, after Belarjan passed away, and then uh, Sensei, um, right before Sensei passed away. Now, I'm, I met with him. I said, Sensei, I said, you know, who, uh, before he decided to appoint me as a successor, I said, why, why, why would you want to appoint me? I mean, um, I, is, I think Kevin would be uh, a better uh, choice. And Kevin Gorganis, he's a, uh, he's a uh, just, uh, he's with Carolina Martial Arts out in Durham, North Carolina. He is just a superb sensei friend um technician you just name his hump he's humble uh, he's just a very very good guy mm -hmm. and um and sensei says well i did ask kevin me before you so i wasn't sensei's first choice because i wasn't around you know mm -hmm. and since they hadn't seen me in seven years and um and even though we had communicated by phone or by uh, email and things like that. Um, I said, oh, you did ask Kevin. I said, okay, great. I said, and what did Kevin say? Um, and he said, he couldn't do it. He just, he did, he had no interest in it. He's just too busy. You know, I said, okay. I said, then what, uh, now that you've offered it to me, I said, I'm going to call Kevin and I'm going to offer it to him. And so I called, I called Kevin and I said, hey, look, I said, this is the conversation that Sensei and I had. I said, I would like for you to be the head of the organization. Because uh, he and I had known each other for like 40 plus years. Yeah. We met each other when we were green belts. He was with another style, all style and Sensei, and he eventually came over to NKJU. But um, he's the, he was a competitor in the martial arts, you know, tournament winner, every, you know, just everything that you could want in a martial artist he is today mm -hmm. and um so i offered it to him i said look all i want to do is just help you 
And uh, he says, Steve, he says, I appreciate that. He said, but Sensei made the right choice. Mm -hmm. He said, you you should be, you were his first student. You were his uh, highest ranking Udonja uh, or black belt. And you should, you should be in charge of the organization. Uh, so, and he says, I will support you. Uh, I said, okay, all right. So uh, we kind of left it at that and, and true to his word, he supports me. I talked to him a couple of days ago and, and, um, but, uh, you know, he is also a, a, not only a member of my organization, but he's a Kobudo sensei under, um, uh, sensei Dimitrich with a Rukyu Kobudo Hozon Shinko guy. It's um, a long sensei name. It, it is. <laughs> Um, I think it translates to something like preserving the traditions of uh, traditional Kobudo. Okay. And, uh, but she is just an awesome, awesome weapons sensei who trained directly under Ak Akamina sensei, the father, you know, and, uh, she, and so he provides me uh, in NKJU as well as sensei Dimitrich, uh, the Kobudo for our organization. And the jiu-jitsu uh, we get from uh, Xi'an Stroud's students, or now Hanchi Stroud, he's passed away. Uh, his students will provide us the the jiu-jitsu training. But also we got in Texas, we got you know, Andy Snyder, who's a seven don under me. Uh, he uh, he does his jiu-jitsu and teaches that as well as his uh, empty hand. Uh, but we got all the different arts that we all come together. If somebody wants to uh, train and test in a particular art, then we have a sensei for that. And if we don't have one, uh, we will go out and we'll find a sensei. Um, but what I refuse to do is, like I see a lot of other organizations do that are multi-organizational systems or style systems, they will sign, you know, say, if the, say if I am a eighth degree black belt and shitaru. I cannot go sign in a fourth degree black belt or whatever in Taekwondo. I'm not ranked in that style. So it's just a no brainer to me. So I get the other person that's I'm, ranked in that style. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. Not everyone feels that way. And I and, don't get it. I will have I, I don't get it either. I don't get it either. If uh someone <laughs> comes to me and you know, they want me to give them a grade on their French paper. <laughs> it's the same set of letters. Doesn't mean I'm qualified to evaluate it. That's right. You know, now if they want me to give them a rank and just karate do, then I'll do that. Okay. You know, um, because karate is karate, you know, you got your basics you got your applications you got your self-defense and everything else all the moves but one thing i'm really i stress a lot is basics yeah i may be an eighth don and a hanchi on paper but i love basics you know and i still see a lot of upper level ranks whose basics are horrible yeah. And uh, so in our organization, when I get us all together, I drill the basics, I look at them, and uh, we go over the many uses of the basics. And then I have other you know, senseis who are, are really great in the upper level stuff, in the, mid, in the middle level stuff. So I can't be, I'm a jack of all trades, I say master or none. You know, I, I, I look at it as, you know, another word for basics are fundamentals or yes. foundational elements. If we think of the foundation of a building, the stronger that foundation, the taller you can build it. That's right. And there are, I think there are a lot of martial artists with a crummy foundation and it, it, it's tippy at the top, a little weebly mm -hmm. wobbly up there. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you 100%. And, uh, and it's, it's important to me that if when people come to NKJF, that they see quality. And that they see the character and they see the integrity of the people that are within it and that it makes them feel good. It makes them feel welcomed and that they know that they can receive some quality training here. And that is mm -hmm. uh, that is competitive with whatever is in their mind. You know, I used to think when I was younger, God, I could wait to go to Japan and learn to train over there. But now that I've been there and I couldn't wait to come back to the USA because I think. 
he, here in America, we have the quality. Yes, I agree. In Japan. And, um, but, you know, uh, you, people have to experience it. Uh, I encourage people to go there to see it. Uh, but if you're going to go there to see it, go there to live there. Okay. And right. then see it on a daily basis. What you see when you go there, whether it be you're just going to a dojo, the train, or for an event, that's just a day or two here and there. Go there for the long term, and you'll see that the quality is just as good here, if not better in some cases. You know, and but because Kuniba Soki was in our lineage, and it was my sensei, sensei, and Ruiz, and all the rest of them, I had the best here. And so yeah. when I went to Japan, it was let me open up my mind there while I'm there and I'll learn from them. So I did. And as I have no regrets. Good. So, um, if people want to learn more about the organization or, or get in touch with you, how would they do that? Uh, they can uh, either go to my Facebook page and, and they just go to uh, uh, just type in National Karate Jiu-Jitsu Federation or NKJF. They can Google me. Um, I'm probably one of the first ones that pops up there under Google. Um, but they can email me at NKJF, that's National Karate Jiu-Jitsu Federation, dot Kaicho, K-A-I-C-H-O, at gmail.com. Perfect. All right. This is this has been great. This has been some some solid stuff, and, and uh, we went some directions that I, I didn't know we were going to go, and I, I always enjoy that. But uh, it is it is time to wind down here, so I'm going to ask you how you want to end in a sense what are your final words to the audience today final words to uh senseis is stay on the dojo floor don't just wear a gi demonstrate leadership be a person of good character and integrity and um just provide an open door policy to anyone who wants to join your organization and you'll be successful as long as you treat them with respect and that's pretty much it and then when it comes to the students same thing you enter a dojo you go there for a reason and and thank you very much uh, sensei for allowing me this opportunity it's really been a pleasure it's been great having you on thanks so much all right take care and uh as far I want to say thank you to Hanchi Steve. I appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for sharing your stories and your time. And one of the things that I came away from our conversation really noting was the integrity, the respect that Steve brought to some of these delicate subjects. You know, some people kind of moving into some places that maybe they shouldn't have been and taking advantage of some things and stealing some names perhaps. But what came through for me was, hey, this is unfortunate. It's not what I want, but it doesn't mean I have to be disrespectful. I'm gonna focus on what I control. I can focus what I do, and I'm just gonna take it as an opportunity to get better. And that I absolutely loved. It's a message that I think so many of us need to hear and take to heart. Now, listeners, you can go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes and all the good stuff that we bring you for each and every episode. You probably have some in your podcast player if you're listening on your phone or your tablet, but there's more than we can put in there. All the great stuff that we have for that episode, for this episode, for all the episodes are available at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're there, you can sign up for the newsletter. You can give, leave us a tip, some cool stuff over there. And, you know, if you have a martial arts school, and you have goals for your martial arts school. If you look at what's going on, you say, you know, Jeremy, I wouldn't mind making more money. I wouldn't mind having more students. I wouldn't mind this, that, or the other. Well, we offer consulting services. We take the same integrity. We take the same business model that we bring to Whistlekick, providing value. And we work with martial arts schools to bring the same sort of integrity and, and value proposition to them and we help them grow. And we have been 100% successful in that effort. So if you're interested, you can either reach out to me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com is my email address. You can also find a little bit more information at whistlekick.com under the school owner section for the consulting. And 
you know, the other thing you might want to consider, I teach seminars. I have a lot of fun teaching seminars. If you enjoy these episodes, if you have a fun time listening to me talk to people, well, guess what? We can have a fun time talking and training. And we don't talk much about me and what I do on the show because the show isn't about me. But that's another place that I'll, I'll be honest, I think I knock it out of the park. And most of the folks who have me in for seminars have me back. So I think I'm doing something right. So you can just reach out to me there. Our social media for Whistlekick is at Whistlekick. Everywhere you might think of, we do the show twice a week. And I appreciate you spending some time with us today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.